Hello, my name is Dr. Brian Perkovich. I'm an ophthalmologist with a subspecialty in vitreoretinal retinal surgery at the Green Bay Eye Clinic in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Um, I take care of primarily retinal problems, which include a large percentage of diabetics. My background training includes a residency at the Cleveland Clinic where I served as chief resident uh, for my ophthalmology training and did further subspecialty training in vitreoretinal retinal surgery at the Mayo Clinic. I've been at the Green Bay Eye Clinic now since the fall of 1990. Today I'm going to speak about diabetic retinopathy, an, an increasing problem in our population, not only in the United States, but worldwide. Some of the implications that it has and how we can better manage it as individuals and as a society. The uh, problem of diabetic retinopathy is increasingly prevalent. It is and continues to increasingly be the leading cause of blindness amongst working age individuals between the ages of 20 and 74. Some estimates place uh, a number of 8,000 individuals becoming blind annually as a result of complications from diabetic retinopathy, and that number is increasing with some estimates being as high as 24,000 individuals in the United States per year. In the developed countries in the Western nations, diabetic retinopathy is becoming increasingly prevalent. Between 1995, when it had a prevalence of approximately 6% in the population, it's estimated that that could increase up to 7.5% by the year 2025. 30% of those individuals who are diabetic are unaware that they're even diabetic, so that almost a third of those affected are undiagnosed until they have significant complications and problems. The economic impact of diabetic retinopathy is huge and increasing. By some estimates, we spend almost $167 million per year on the care of and treating the complications and sequelae of diabetic retinopathy. I can't emphasize enough that the treatment of diabetic retinopathy is much more successful at preventing visual loss than it is to try to reverse changes once they've occurred. The incidence of diabetic retinopathy for type 2 diabetics, what is or was in the past generally termed adult onset diabetes is approximately 4% at the time that someone is initially diagnosed. The primary factors that are understood currently as to whether or not one develops significant diabetic retinopathy are the length of time one is diabetic and the control of their blood sugars. In type 1 or what was previously termed juvenile onset diabetes, the incidence of diabetic retinopathy is quite rare prior to the development of puberty. Like type 2 diabetics, type 1 diabetics will be more likely to develop proliferative changes as they have the disease for a longer duration. So that by the time they've been diabetic for 15 years, almost a quarter of them will have proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And by the time they've had the disease 20 years, more than half of them will develop it. Since type 1 diabetes is more characteristically a disease of younger individuals, these people have a much longer period of time over which they're at risk for the development of these complications, and it's really, therefore, a lifetime necessity of being monitored and or treated if necessary. In this slide, I'd like to explain the part of the eye that we're going to be most commonly speaking of in terms of diabetic complications. The retina is the lining in the back of the eye that one can think of as being analogous to the film in the camera where the light is focused. The very center part of the retina is called the macula, the portion that is most commonly affected by macular edema. The optic nerve pictured on the right there is where the blood vessels enter into the back of the eye, the normal blood vessels, and exit again. The blood vessels can be seen as the red irregular lines that some people will describe as looking almost like rivers. These are affected by the diabetes and we'll get into more detail on that. Another way to visualize and picture where the retina is in the eye can be seen in this cross section. The entire inside, approximately back two thirds of the eye is covered by the lining of the retina. And it's that part that is non-visible to a casual examiner that is most commonly affected by the diabetes and why it's so important that individuals with diabetes have a dilated eye exam in order to allow for good visualization and examination of this area. 
In non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, those blood vessels that you just saw are damaged by the elevated blood sugar over a long period of time so that those blood vessels become weakened and therefore become more prone to leak and cause swelling or edema. Another significant factor in this is high blood pressure or hypertension. It's part of the triad of what is now considered the metabolic syndrome, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, diabetes, that commonly go hand in hand. So when the normal blood vessels in the back of the eye become damaged by the diabetes, I tell individuals that if they have hypertension on top of that, that they can picture that as having leaky pipes in their basement and they're gonna leak more if you turn up the pressure. Microaneurysms are small focal areas of damage to the normal blood vessels in back that also then can leak, causing fluid accumulation, swelling of the retina, and when that swelling occurs, that is what decreases vision when it affects the center part of the maculum. I also tell patients that they can think of this as stretching out a sweater. If we take a sweater and we stretch it out and you let go immediately, it's going to snap back pretty well. If you stretch it out and hold it there for a week and then you stretch it out a little more and it gets stretched out further over the course of the month and now we let go, it's not going to snap back nearly to its original configuration. This is analogous to the retina becoming swollen. If the center part of your vision becomes swollen so that that retina is microscopically stretched and now I intervene and treat it, I'm not going to be able to get it to snap back all the way to normal. And the more it's stretched out, the less we're going to be able to return it to a normal configuration. Ideally, therefore, what we want to do is catch that swelling as it's approaching the very center part of the vision, but before it affects it in order to be able to hopefully reverse it and keep one seeing normal or at least as best as possible. That means often seeing their eye doctor before they know they have any symptoms. Other manifestations of the non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy are what are called hard exudates. These are something you can think of basically as cholesterol deposits in the retina. If you have swelling in the retina, macular edema, that is long-standing and is present for months, and this is a very gradual process. It doesn't occur in a matter of days or weeks. But if that's present for months, then the normal fat and cholesterol in the serum of our blood will settle out and form what are termed hard exudates and what you can think of as cholesterol and fatty deposits. When those deposit in the very center part of the retina, they can cause irreversible damage that we are unable to uh, totally reverse. Even if we can induce resolution or reabsorption of these hard exudates, oftentimes the visual results are irreversible with permanent reduction. Hemorrhages are common. These are occurring within the retina. These will come and go over time in various areas. And then the macular edema that I've been referring to, or the swelling. These next two pictures demonstrate some of the manifestations that I've been describing. The areas of yellow labeled HE, or hard exudates, are those cholesterol deposits settling out of the swollen areas in the retina. They can be induced either from the normal blood vessels diffusely leaking, or you can have specific focal areas of leakage from microaneurysms, such as are labeled MA. Those can be f seen as focal red spots or dilatation on normal blood vessels in the back of the eye that have occurred as a result of the diabetes and often are exacerbated by hypertension. The next slide displays several small hemorrhages that are common in diabetes. In general, these hemorrhages don't have any consequence on vision directly unless they happen to occur right in the center part of the macula, the center part of the retina. I'd like to talk a little more in detail about diabetic macular edema or the swelling in the retina. It's, as I mentioned, the most common reason why type 2 or adult onset diabetics lose vision permanently. It becomes more prevalent as you've been diabetic longer. It also is more prevalent <coughs> if your disease is poorly controlled. I can't emphasize enough how important it is to keep ideal control of blood sugars and blood pressure. I have many individuals, including unfortunately a father who are diabetic, who make the argument that, well, they may not wish to make the effort and take on the inconvenience of checking their blood sugars frequently, getting daily exercise, um, watching their diet, because if they have a complication, well, they'll accept that heart attack and, and just die. Unfortunately, it's often not that type of scenario that plays out. Uh, oftentimes, the diabetic complications produce decreased vision, affecting the quality of life. So now one can't drive, watch television, read, see the faces of grandchildren, or they have the heart attack or renal failure that incapacitates them or 
place, places them on a dialysis regimen three times a week and limits their travel so that it's a quality of life issue more than anything that necessitates ideal diabetic control. There are certain levels of diabetic swelling or macular edema that necessitate our intervention. Not everybody with diabetic macular edema needs treatment. However, some of the scenarios that do require treatment are listed here, and they are defined as edema involving the very center part of the macula, which is termed the fovea, or swelling or thickening of the retina within 500 microns of it, those hard exudates, those cholesterol deposits approaching within a similar distance, or an area of swelling that is moderate in size approaching within a moderate distance of the center part of the vision. The example of exudates within 500 microns of the center of the vision is shown where one can see the optic nerve on the right. The very center of the macula is just left the center of the picture, which would be termed the fovea, and all those little small yellow spots just to the left of center are the hard exudates. Those are now approaching within 500 microns, and if one knows how large a millimeter is, 500 microns is about a half a millimeter. If those exudates are approaching that close, associated with swelling in that area, we need to then step in and treat that in order to try to get those to dissipate and prevent them from extending into the very center. This individual would be asymptomatic, that is, they wouldn't have any symptoms of blurred vision, but at this stage, we would need to treat them in order to prevent them from developing blurred vision. On the next two slides, uh, there's an example of an individual who underwent treatment having a cluster of these hard exudates just to the right of center, the small yellow dots. That's as the exam existed prior to treatment. We closed some specific microaneurysms with laser, which is just a procedure that's done in the office. It's painless during the treatment. It's painless after the treatment. An individual goes home as an outpatient the same day as treatment with no restrictions in their activity. And then the next slide demonstrates that several months later, those exudates have reabsorbed, the patient still has 20-20 vision, and that is a successful outcome. Now this is not necessarily always a once-in-a-lifetime treatment. I explain to individuals that just as they don't take insulin or take their medication for their diabetic blood sugar control once, and that's cured, similarly, the diabetes can continue to have its effect on the eyes for the individual's lifetime. Another uh, scenario of what we consider diabetic swelling that requires intervention is an area of moderate involvement uh, within a disc diameter about a millimeter and a half of the center part of the vision where there's a cluster of the heart exudates, several hemorrhages that you can see, and that area would also require treatment, although it's not involved in the center, it's not quite as close to the center as the previous individual that I showed you, but because of the area involved being moderate in size, we would also step in in a scenario like this. After non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, pre-proliferative diabetic retinopathy is the next stage in development or progression of diabetic changes in the eye. This can be seen in what are termed nerve fiber layer infarcts or cotton wool spots, the various white spots throughout the retina. Those represent areas where the capillaries, the smallest blood vessels in the body, are beginning to close off and become basically obliterated. Other changes that will be seen in preproliferative diabetic retinopathy are changes in the vasculature or the blood vessels, termed intraretinal microvascular abnormalities. Some of the uh, double arrows and the single arrows in this photograph display areas of irregular blood vessels that are still not abnormal but are uh, aberrations in the normal vasculature and portend a development towards the development of abnormal blood vessel growth in the back of the eye. Proliferative diabetic retinopathy is the more severe manifestation of diabetic effects in the eye. You can see that these are actual abnormal blood vessels growing in the back of an eye. The larger red lines are normal vasculature, normal blood vessels. The multiple smaller and irregular blood vessels that cover much of the upper two-thirds of the photograph should not be there and are what can occur again silently and without any symptoms over time and can produce the most severe changes that can result in true blindness, true blackness for individuals who don't have this detected or treated. On the next photographs, there's examples of the extreme scar tissue that can then form as a result of these abnormal blood vessels. Those are the white areas that you can see. They're just sheets of abnormal blood vessels and resultant scar tissue that can grow over the back of an eye, distorting a retina, distorting vision, pulling on the retina to the point where it detaches it and then can produce decreased vision or even blindness. At this stage, this requires surgical intervention, a stage that we'd rather prevent by detecting this much earlier.
proliferative diabetic retinopathy can also produce hemorrhages, and that scar tissue can produce pulling or traction on the retina, producing a detachment. In proliferative diabetic retinopathy, you can also have swelling or diabetic macular edema at the same time. One does not preclude the other. The red area on the bottom half displays a hemorrhage beginning to occur from those abnormal blood vessels despite treatment. The blackened areas around the edge of that photograph display scar tissue from previous laser applied in an attempt to control the abnormal blood vessels, and yet despite that, this individual's developed a hemorrhage in front of the retina that will block vision in those areas and can further increase the risk of scar tissue producing a retinal detachment. It's often at this stage that, despite laser, that surgery is required. I should also mention that laser, whether it's for proliferative diabetic retinopathy or diabetic macular edema, does not guarantee one of stabilization of vision. It dramatically reduces the risk of losing vision. It increases our chance of controlling the disease, but it doesn't guarantee that the swelling would go away, that the abnormal blood vessels would go away, and that there'd be no further compromise in vision. If the hemorrhage becomes more extensive, as shown in the next two pictures, now the vision becomes significantly compromised to the point where someone may be able to only see how many fingers are being held up a few feet away from them or see vague motion or outlines. Our view in is also significantly compromised in order to be able to determine exactly what's occurring in back. So at this stage, the disease has become quite advanced and now much more likely to require surgical intervention. The last manifestation that I'd like to talk about before we talk about treatment in more detail is abnormal blood vessel growth in the front part of the eye as seen on the next two photos. On the front colored part of the eye, which expands and contracts and controls the size of the pupil, that colored part being termed the iris, abnormal blood vessels can grow on that as well. Typically, these are not able to be seen with the naked eye. On the second photograph, there are the large, red, ropey, irregular areas growing uh, around the pupil, especially just left and up of center in the photograph. These abnormal blood vessels can cause a severe form of glaucoma that can be difficult or at times impossible to control and can lead to blindness once again. Not only is this type of glaucoma, but routine glaucoma, termed open angle glaucoma, and cataracts are much more prevalent in diabetic individuals as well. Other reasons to have routine exams and other potential reasons for visual loss in diabetics. At this stage, we're dealing with a much more limited likelihood of restoring a significant amount of vision to a level that would allow them to carry on many of the routine daily activities. So again, I can't emphasize enough that this needs to be detected early, which means being compliant with examinations with a primary care physician, with an eye care specialist, and uh, with controlling the diabetic blood sugar level as well as the blood pressure. Photocoagulation is the term for laser, and as I mentioned a few moments ago, it's much more effective for limiting the risk of visual loss further than it is for regaining vision already lost. In general, treatment for either the proliferative changes, the abnormal blood vessels, or for macular edema, the swelling, the treatment can reduce the risk of losing significant further levels of vision by about half. Doesn't guarantee it. We do have treatments now beyond the laser. For the diabetic swelling now, we have for the last several years been utilizing small amounts of cortisone actually injected into the eye that can frequently help actually significantly reverse swelling and improve vision, although there are limitations to that treatment as well. On occasion, surgery via a vitrectomy, which I'll be discussing momentarily, can help the swelling if there's scar tissue pulling on a retina and inducing further leakage from those already damaged normal blood vessels. Sometimes alleviating that scar tissue and that pulling will help reduce swelling. Some of the newer medications used for macular degeneration, termed vascular endothelial growth factor inhibitors, such as Avastin and Lucentis, are being tried to help reduce the swelling as well. So that as opposed to even a decade ago when our treatment was limited primarily to laser, we now have several other modalities in our armamentarium that can be utilized and effective, but we are still dealing often with trying to limit visual loss, regain some degree without restoring vision to normal, and preferring to catch a disease early in its path rather than later. For proliferative diabetic retinopathy, I'll briefly touch on what we're looking for in terms of those abnormal blood vessels. Uh, we don't treat every area of swelling, 
If an area of swelling is far from the center, sometimes these areas will abate and dissipate on their own. Similarly, so therefore, you may come in and your eye care professional may tell you you have some diabetic macular edema, some diabetic swelling, but we don't need to do anything yet. Let's take a look in three or four months. And if it dissipates, we may get by with not doing anything at all. But it's important to observe that because if it progresses, we'd want to catch it as it progresses slowly before it hopefully produces symptoms, be able to step in and take care of it. I find it sometimes difficult to convince individuals to keep coming back for exams when they feel like they're seeing well. I'm not asking them to undergo any treatment and they think that they're coming in uh, for perhaps less than necessary reasons. The same for proliferative diabetic retinopathy. They have a small area of abnormal blood vessel growth. We may be able to watch it, sometimes for months or even years. However, if those abnormal blood vessels, such as in the bottom third of the picture, if those abnormal blood vessels get large in size, even before they start to hemorrhage, and this individual's had a little hemorrhage around the margins in the lower right-hand corner of the photograph, that individual with that extent of abnormal blood vessels would then require treatment. The abnormal blood vessels can grow over the optic nerve as shown on the next two photographs. The irregular red areas and red lines over the circular area of the optic nerve, when those become extensive, they require treatment. When those abnormal blood vessels over the optic nerve are greater than an area covering one-fourth of it, then that requires intervention and that standard treatment still is laser. If the abnormal blood vessels of any size, as shown on the next picture, begin to produce a hemorrhage where the details of the retina are now obscured, then that would also require intervention. At this stage, sometimes we have to give the blood time to settle because just as an individual can't see through the blood, I can't see through it into the back of their eye to, on occasion, determine what exactly is occurring or let alone to place the laser. So we may end up waiting weeks to months for this hemorrhage to clear. That's often frightening and frustrating for patients. The other option is to intervene surgically. Uh, however, every surgery does have its risk, and therefore we're always weighing the pros and cons of waiting versus intervening. When the abnormal blood vessels off the optic nerve become of a moderate size and produce a vitreous hemorrhage, those two would require a laser. These are further examples, these photographs showing in the center and then to the bottom half of the photographs examples further of abnormal blood vessel growth. That can sometimes be subtle, and again, why you need someone trained in this specific uh, avenue of ocular exams in order to sometimes be able to detect and therefore intervene for these changes. If you develop significant diabetic changes, you may be further evaluated with a test called the fluorescein angiogram. This is a series of photographs taken in the office with a teaspoon of dye injected in the vein in the arm that can display and demonstrate to us the changes in detail to the normal blood vessels and the abnormal ones are growing that can't be seen just with a routine exam and lenses. As the dye passes through the normal circulation in the back of the eye, the normal blood vessels appear white. And that photograph currently being displayed is an example of a normal patient with no evidence of diabetic changes. The next photograph demonstrates treatment being performed as I mentioned, in the office, as an outpatient, treatment for swelling is painless and just bright. Treatment for abnormal blood vessels is primarily bright. Patients on occasion describe small twinges of discomfort. And the angiogram demonstrates what I might be using as a guide to place that treatment. Near the center are multiple small white dots, and those are the microaneurysms, or the small leakage of the abnormal blood vessels uh, that can produce the swelling and the edema that we would be attempting to close with the laser in order to stop that leakage, induce resolution of the swelling, and maintain a stable level of vision. The other pattern of laser for the abnormal blood vessels is placed in a scatter fashion towards the peripheral aspects of the retina called panretinal photocoagulation. The pattern is demonstrated on the artist's rendition where it spares the very central aspect of the retina. Immediately after the treatment on the next slide, you'll see to the left the multiple white spots that would be seen to an examiner or an eye doctor if they looked in back. These are never going to be visible to anyone uh, casually, uh, externally, so that an individual won't be able to tell that they've had this placed or when seen by another. And then as those laser scars mature, they turn darker as seen on the right half. Before surgery, your physician may perform an ultrasound. An ultrasound is a way to help us see through that hemorrhage 
and get an idea of the anatomy of the back of the eye to make sure there's not a retinal detachment. This often enables us to allow a patient to observe a hemorrhage for several months. Many times hemorrhages in the eye will spontaneously reabsorb, go away on their own if given time. Although frustrating for several months, that sometimes is preferable to a patient, especially if only one eye is affected, if they prefer not to have surgery, if they have other medical problems or the work schedules that preclude them from having surgical intervention. Performing an ultrasound, which is a painless office procedure, similar to a pregnant woman undergoing an ultrasound, uh, this may allow us to advise them that an option of careful observation is quite reasonable. On the other hand, if that ultrasound demonstrates significant scar tissue forming, uh, there's traction on the retina, an early retinal detachment, that would also be a reason then to intervene earlier with surgery, thus allowing us hopefully to prevent further progression of the disease that could compromise the amount of vision we can regain long term. An example of the ultrasound results that we might obtain are demonstrated on the photographs which display these multiple white areas inside the eye that should be just black being optically clear on the ultrasound exam and when the echoes return densely white as they have in this individual that represents a hemorrhage from the diabetic abnormal blood vessels but underlying that we can see in this person there is no scar tissue deforming the contour of the back of the eye or producing a retinal detachment. Some hemorrhages are seen to be just held in pockets in front of the retina you can tell that this, these hemorrhages are in front of the retina by the fact that they obscure the visualization of the retinal blood vessels underlying them. When they're stuck in a tight pocket close to the retina, these can often tend to form scar tissue much more quickly than if the hemorrhage is diffuse inside the entire back of the eye. And this may be an indication for proceeding with surgery within several weeks rather than potentially waiting several months. An individual with hemorrhage like this will have large portions of their vision which are just black to them because the hemorrhage just totally obscures the light from penetrating to the retina and they won't be able to see in these areas covered by blood of this density. On the next photographs there is more diffuse hemorrhage. It's just diffusely red. It's not stuck in a tight pocket and those types of scenarios may be able to be observed for months if an individual wishes. On the other hand with current modern surgical techniques our risk of complications is quite low and if an individual is frustrated, if it's their better seeing eye previous to the occurrence of the hemorrhage, if they really need good vision in both eyes for their employment, we can intervene surgically earlier for these individuals as well. The surgical technique is pictured in the artist rendition whereby we make three small incisions in the eye and infuse a clear fluid to make up for the blood that we're removing and while one instrument cuts up and removes that blood and another instrument allows us to shine a light, a fiber optic light into the eye to help us visualize what we're doing. During the last several years the instrumentation has become much smaller to the point where now the majority of surgery done in this fashion, at least here at the Green Bay Eye Clinic, no longer requires a suture. The incisions are so small that the, when the instruments are removed the elasticity of the tissue closes the incision normally and therefore does not require a stitch. I tell patients to think of this as having blood drawn in their arm. The thin needle is withdrawn, the elasticity of the tissue closes the small needle penetration site and you don't require a suture. And that heals itself, it seals and doesn't leak. Similarly with the ocular techniques that we use now with such small instrumentation, we can perform surgery much quicker than we could in the past when we had to make larger incisions, place multiple sutures, the Comfort level following surgery is much greater. Individuals now frequently require little to no pain medication after surgery, perhaps even just Tylenol or Motrin, if anything at all. And the recovery is much quicker. Instead of taking months for an individual's vision to recover optimally, now it's not uncommon for them to be seeing well within a couple of weeks. The return to activity is much quicker. Rather than three or four weeks, now we often have patients returning to work in a week or two. When we're performing the surgery, the view is uh, such that we're looking through the pupil, through a microscope, and an assistant is helping us to hold the lens in order to visualize removal of the blood and any scar tissue in the back of the eye. Some of the other reasons that why we might perform surgery in addition to removing blood is rendered uh, by the artist on the pictures that demonstrate areas of scar tissue labeled as vitreous pulling, and we can go in and as shown on the next picture with some very small instruments and scissors and forceps slowly delicately remove that scar tissue 
so that the pulling on the retina is alleviated, thus restoring it to a normal anatomic configuration, or perhaps allowing the swelling I spoke of before to be diminished by having the normal blood vessels no longer under traction. A few pictures uh, that show a before and after demonstration of the potential results of the surgical intervention.